Hello everyone and welcome to the very last session here today and the last session of Health and Safety Month for 2017. My name's Erin O'Donoghue, um, part of the Strategy 2030 team at WorkSafe Victoria and I'll be MC for the, set, the last session today. So of course, I'm sure you've heard this a few times already, but just some, a few house pieces of housekeeping. So um, Damien is going to hang around after the session today to answer questions one-on-one -on -one if you have any, but he will we'll also allow time at the end for questions with the roving mic. So if you've got any as we're going through the session, please jot them down. Um, of course, call out to the social media users in the audience. Don't forget to hashtag HSMonth, any of your photos or your tweets as we go through the session. And please ensure that your mobile phone is either switched off or popped onto silent, please. In the event of an emergency, the venue will direct us to the nearest evacuation assembly area. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Damien Han Hanlon, who's a WorkSafe inspector from the psychosocial operations team at WorkSafe Victoria. Damien joined WorkSafe in 2012 as an inspector. Since commencing with WorkSafe, he's worked in various multidisciplinary teams before transferring to the psychosocial team last year. Previous to being employed with WorkSafe, Damien was employed in compliance and enforcement roles with state government departments. Damien has also held management level positions with a multinational organisation whose core work in building, engineering and facilities management. So Damien's very well equipped to speak to us on this topic today. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Damien. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Last session, we've got the biggest venue, so um, I think my employer is expecting big things, so we'll see how we go. Um, as mentioned, my name's Damien Hanlon. I'm an inspector with the psychosocial team. We're a state-based team that deals with mental health in the workplace, predominantly bullying. There's 13 of us um, around the state, of which I'm one. Um, Last night, I've got my notes here in front of me, and we'll go through in terms of what we're talking about. I was flicking through the presentation after dinner last night, and um, I've got a young bloke, he's nine, in grade three. He goes, oh, Dad, um, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just looking at a few notes, mate. I've got a presentation tomorrow. He goes, oh, yeah, OK. Um, he goes, how long does that go for? I said, an hour. He goes, an hour? I'm like, yeah. He goes, Dad, if I had to listen to someone talk for an hour, I'd fall asleep. So if I can keep you guys awake, I think I'll be halfway there. But really what I want to do today, it's a little bit interactive, not role play interactive, but interactive in terms of there is Q&A the, towards the end of the session. But it's really important as an inspector, particularly around bullying, that we sort of hear from you guys. The importance around that is because this is behaviour related. If you've gone to other sessions earlier today, you might have gone to say manual handling. You're talking about regulations. There's measurements, there's weights. You look at things around the regs, around asbestos, there's thresholds. This is behaviour related. So we're really talking about interpretation, aren't we? My, inter my interpretation, your interpretation, and I guess what you've got happening at your workplace in terms of what you, um, how you see things around workplace bullying. So I'll have, a little, I'll have a look at that today. I'll have to talk about the legislation because it's important about the legislation. I'll keep it as interesting as I possibly can because ultimately what you guys want to do is you want to go back to your workplace and you want to make sure what you've got in place is sufficient to meet your obligations under the Act. And towards the end, I'll go through what I do when I get a job, what it looks like and what it's going to look like for you. And what I want to hear from you is in terms of what you think it looks like from your end. We'll talk about the employer's responsibilities, the impacts of bullying. I'll share some of my experiences. Of course, I'm limited to use any names of employers or employees, and I won't do that, so I'll sort of talk in a general sense. But hopefully you'll get a little bit out of it. One of the most important things when we speak about workplace bullying, um, we're looking at prevention and response. I want you to focus on prevention and response. When I first joined WorkSafe five years ago, first day, induction, yeah, you do a little bit of you know, corporate sort of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. In the afternoon, there's, I think I went through with about 16 other new inductees. The instructor gets up and he says, what's the principles of health and safety? What's the core principles of health and safety? Now, mindful, there was about you know, 18 of us in the room. We had to go through all this you know, testing to get there. I thought there were some pretty smart people in the room. And we're all sitting there looking at each other. We didn't know the principles of health and safety. 
And why are principles important? Why, in essence, why is the principles of the Health and Safety Act important? Because this is what this is formed on. So when I'm talking about workplace bullying and prevention and response, remember this. So employers, the first principle of the Act, it's on page two, says people are entitled to the highest level of protection as far as reasonably practical. So if you're a solicitor and you're representing something and something went all the way through to the courts, ultimately that's your position, isn't it? Has my client been afforded the highest level of protection for the risk? So when we're talking about bullying, and if you're sitting on the employer side, you need to be able to answer that. So the principle also talks about, obviously, people having ownership, management and control, responsibilities, be proactive with health and safety, and the focus in, in terms of exchange information and consultation. That's part one, pretty simple around the principles. Part two, which is an important part as well, predominantly talks about the functions of the authority, the authority being the Victorian Work Cover Authority, trading as work safe. What's our function? We hear work safe, people think, well, basically, I know you guys would say to me if you had a microphone, oh, compliance and enforcement. That's one function in part two. There's others. Provide information part of our role, part of what I'm doing now, part of what you should expect us to be doing in your workplace with the bullying prevention and any type of hazards. Uh, and the other ones, and this is, the important, this is another important one, it's not solely just three, but I just picked this one out when I was going through the presentation, to foster relationships between employees and employers. That's the function of the authority. I come into your workplace, and we were gonna talk about workplace bullying, to foster relationships between employer and employee. Because what's really happened when I go there for a response work, how do you think that relationship's going? You think it needs fostering, you think it's broken? Irreparable? Bit of a combination of both. So what's workplace bullying? Characterised by persistent, repeated negative behaviour directed towards an employee or group of employees that creates a risk to health and safety. Persistent and repeated. Not one off. Persistent and repeated. I bought the Act, 177 pages. How many times do you think the word bullying is mentioned in here? Less than five, ten? Zero. Not in here. Don't be confusing, I'm knocking on your door, I'm talking about bullying, it's not even in the Act. Damien, you're talking to me about the principles. Where's bullying appearing here? What's my obligations? Not defined in the Act. I was talking to someone the other day, and they're going, oh, you're doing your presentation on bullying. Yeah, he goes, oh, how do you find that? You know, it'd be pretty hard, mate. Everyone's got different opinions on it, you know. Like, I sort of, you know, I talk about this, and it's in the regs, and it's easy. And it's right, the regs are easy, because one plus one equals two. What does that equal? Persistent and repeated negative behaviour. And we'll talk about what those behaviours are. There's the obvious behaviours, there's the not so obvious behaviours. Here they are. Direct, indirect. Direct's pretty sort of simple sort of stuff. Because you can see it. What was said, perhaps what was done. Verbal, rumours, yeah, we're familiar with them. About interfering with someone's personal property or equipment, work equipment. Had a job, apprentice in the trades industry. And I'm not picking on the trades, I'll give you all different examples across industries if you like. His first name started with L, this young bloke. Got to work one day, someone had jumped on the Vic Roads website and cut out all these L, you know, like the learner plates or whatever. Put on his tools, got a shirt made up for him, L. One day at work. Is that bullying? Persistent and repeated behaviours. There's other things that roll from there, but that's just a little bit of an example. Some people, you know, yell back at me and say, no, that's not bullying, it's a one-off. Guy's having a joke on site, went to a bit of trouble, a bit of expense. It was done by two o'clock, nothing else from it. Indirect behaviours. This is the one that really 
is the topic of discussion, because the direct behaviours, I can, I can generally get some evidence, statements, what was said, what was done, people record notes. What about indirect behaviours? Withholding information, excluding someone from work activity. What's a work activity? Lunch? Some type of social engagement in between the day's work? not being part of the social team, the social network, setting tasks unreasonably above or below a worker's ability. We get a lot of, a lot, we get a proportion of what we know, service requests with that allegation. I can't do this work. They ask me to do things that are not reasonable. Just as important as what is, is what is not. You know, the employees go, oh, mate, I can't do anything. We can't breathe around here. This joint's sterile. You blokes are creating, the, you know, work safe, everything's sterile. You're creating a sterile environment. No, no, we don't want a sterile environment. But there's things that aren't workplace bullying and they're important. Performance management is not workplace bullying. KPIs, targets, are just the natural course of our workday, aren't they? This is what our expectations are. We have to meet certain requirements. I have to meet certain requirements which I don't think my manager's here, so she can't comment on how that's going, but we all, we all have to. Um, what is the work, workplace bullying? I did a training course about six months ago. WorkSafe had this set up down in Port Melbourne. They've got these little makeshift offices. They bring actors in just to make sure around your communication skills. I was the most senior person in that room. I was with a group of newly appointed inspectors. So even though I only had five years, I thought, oh, yeah, I sort of got them covered. Anyway, you do this role play, you come back into the room, it gets watched on a screen by, you know, the people overseeing the whole exercise. They call you back into this room, a table of 12, and they say, who wants their feedback in a group forum? Now, everyone's too scared to put their hand up, so everyone just gets their feedback, right? So they get to the first two people, and they go, oh, that's really good. They get to me. They go, oh, how do you think you went? I'm thinking, oh, any time you hear that, it's probably not great. And so I'm thinking, oh, you know, fumbled my way through. Oh, I thought I could have improved. Oh, I was a little bit out of my comfort zone, a few buzzwords, you know. And I said, oh, yeah, we're glad you said that because we thought that was the worst out of everyone. <laughs> so I'm looking around and I'm thinking, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've done a thousand jobs more than that person, right? I think... I know what I'm doing, and that's the feedback. So they go, we've got an afternoon session. We think you might be able to improve on what you did. So I go after the afternoon session, come back, do it again, get the feedback. What happened this time? We didn't see a level of improvement. So anyway, I live down at Geelong, so by the time I get home, by the time I jump in my car, go across the Westgate Bridge, and you know, I'm sort of you know, breathing and thinking about taking every drive through between here and Laverton North. But that's not bullying. As much as I didn't like it, and I didn't want to hear it, and I was a bit embarrassed by it, and I didn't really think it was extremely accurate, because we never really like to hear that information, but it's not bullying. Realistic, achievable performance standards and deadlines. So what's the impact, impact of bullying? You can see there from the chart, really, I look at this, I sort of split that down the middle. There's the human side, see the morale, depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide, and there's the work side. What's going on in the workplace? Those of us who have been involved in any workplace where bullying's occurred and you've been involved in somehow of the process, absenteeism, lost productivity, high staff turnover, I've been involved previous to WorkSafe. Not directly, but indirectly, because there's two colleagues involved in this process. So what happens? You know, the manager says to me, oh, Damien, you know, there's a little bit going on in the office. We need you to pick this bit of work up. Yeah, OK, well, I'm, you know what? I'm running at 100% already. I don't know if I've got that time in the day. You know? So what gets to Friday night? I get home and say to my wife, oh, I don't want to go to work on Monday. And then when I'm there, I'm not really that motivated. This is not my problem. This is not my fault. And with the people that are feeling or experience like they're being bullied. 
increased absenteeism, high staff turnover. How hard is it when you get someone new? We've all had to be there. We get someone new, got to train them up, do a little bit. You're really doing a job and a half for a little while, aren't you, until they sort of start falling on their feet? Let alone the cost to the employer when they have to undertake an investigation, or should, and I'll get to that later. The other side, low morale, motivation, depression and anxiety. I can't talk about it because I don't... I'm not qualified to talk about it, only to speak to you guys that when we meet with the, what's referred as the complainant who puts the service request through, they're pretty fragile. Now, I'm no expert in reading people, but we all meet people and we sort of get a sense how they're going. They're fairly fragile. And the thoughts of suicide, and in some instance, suicide, um, WorkSafe do a little bit of work with Brody's Law. Damien and Ray Panlock, Brody Panlock, took her own life in 2006, jumped off a building through workplace bullying, 19-year-old girl. That's an extreme. I know it's an extreme. But we do these presentations, we go out with the parents, and they sit there and they try to tell the story to get through, generally to the younger workers, you know, around the TAFEs and things like that. And you listen to the mum and the mum goes, oh, she just come around for dinner the night before. I just didn't see it. There's something I just missed and I relive it. I just didn't see it. Powerful sort of stuff around workplace bullying. Recent prosecution... I am based in Geelong, but we just use this as an example, and again, not picking on the building industry, because a lot of times people come in and they go, this is not happening, mate. This is, you're stuck in the 90s, mate. This is 1980, 1990s. This stuff doesn't go on in workplaces anymore. We get about 5,000 calls to our advisory every year. We go to about 500 of those jobs as a screening process, which I'll talk about a little bit later. You know, I've got files on my desk. I can't show you, just take face value. Right, there's content that's similar that sits in there in those files. It still goes on. So this recent prosecution down in Geelong, Geelong builder, no names. Don't concentrate on that fine at the moment. I can't talk about the fine anyway. But I can't have an opinion on the fine. But the victim is young guy, apprentice, and this is what happened to him. He was spat at. He had liquid nail squirt in his hair. And so I can read this. I can read this. And it's so probably, probably words going through. But if I had someone standing here, a 17-year-old, 19-year-old kid, and I started doing that, people wouldn't be able to watch it. People would turn away. Probably get a few complaints themselves. That's too full on. So even though they're words, what I want you to do is just think about that, and that's what's happening. So when we talk about the subjective, and we can talk about this, and bullying's not in there, you know, a lot of times people go and they go to your workplace and they go, what are you looking for, mate? What, what are you guys looking for through all this control process? There's simple rules in terms of what we're looking for and that's not it. That's not our starting point. The builder, obviously convicted and fined, 12500 bucks. It's a long magistrate's court. I mean, I guess the only good part about that is that Geelong, I live down the Geelong way, so everyone knows who this person is. So in terms of doing business, they're not really going to engage with this person anymore, be associated with that employer. So what's the role? This is a little bit boring. This is about 21, section 21 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. We talk about the duties and responsibilities. So employers, get your pens out because this is what we need. All right, you've got an obligation back to the principles, highest level of protection. You must provide and maintain a safe workplace as far as reasonably practical. How do you do that in terms of bullying? Their behaviours. Can I stop Johnny talking to Tony like that? Johnny's not my six-year-old son. Can I, how am I going to stop him doing that? You get some policies in place. What sort of policies? It's the bullying policy. Should have something out there. Sometimes it's bullying, harassment, whatever it looks like, a bullying policy. Within that policy, it should say what bullying is. Give some examples. Within that policy, it should have what bullying isn't. 
give some examples. Within that policy, it should say, if you're feeling bullied, if it meets one of those criteria, who you see. Some really good policies, and you don't have to put this in. It talks about time frames, response. If I get it, I'm feeling bullied, and I go to our policy, I want to have a look. Yep, that meets the criteria. I need to go and see Joan. She's HR. Joan needs to respond to me within a week, unless there's exceptional circumstances, and the matter's kept private at that stage. That's what I want to see. What about an employee who's been accused of bullying and there's nothing in it? What about what's in your policy for them? What about something about vexatious complaints? Don't be afraid to put that in. You know, there's something in there and someone's bringing up things that aren't relevant. Put it in there. Safeguard yourself. It's what the Act talks about. What is your system of work around prevention and response? And at the bare minimum, the system's going to use the document as a reference. Standards of behaviour, obviously that comes from the management, the code of conduct, you'd expect to see that in a workplace of some type. Information, training and induction. So the first part, we talk about policies and procedures, that's your system. So in WorkSafe, make an inquiry, what's your system for prevention and response? Here, Damien, I've got this policy. Do people know about it? Provide information, training and induction. 21-2E. Generally, when we prosecute, we'll prosecute under, this is generalisation, 21-2A, your system will work and your failure to provide information, instruction and training. They almost run hand in hand. So, who gets trained and what on? How am I going to train, train people on bullying? Well, first of all, information. Everyone should at least have the policy, signed off on the policy. What about training? Who's getting what training? What do you think we should expect in terms of the training that um, is undertaken? How about the people who receive, in your organisation, that evidence of first complaint? Oh, Damien, I'm going to walk into Jane's office. Jane, I'm feeling bullied. Okay. Uh, okay. Are we relying on Joan's personal skills or have we resourced Joan with some communication techniques to at least get from here to here? Driving a positive culture and obviously review workplace processes, be aware of psychosocial risks. This one's in here, role of supervisor. You might go, hang on, we just looked at a slide of role of employer, management, supervisor. Supervisor is pretty fundamental because when I go to a workplace, bullying related or general, generally, you know what, I get the supervisor. We get, as inspectors, the supervisor because the supervisor's there. They're coordinating the work. They're the eyes and ears. So when I'm talking about information, instruction and training around the policy, are you going to give the leading hand or a couple of guys on the tools, the same training as you're going to give the supervisor, probably the supervisor should have a higher level of training. Dealing with workplace bullying, that first complaint, strategies. Another course that I failed, I wouldn't say failed, but I could have improved on in WorkSafe, they put me on a course for active listening. Who was laughing? I think the girls laugh at this. Because the boys don't know what it is. And I'm not playing the gender card, but generally the blokes aren't good at it. Right? Active listening. It was one of the worst days I've had in work. So I got put up the front, we had this psychologist, and they listen to people for a living, as probably I do, so I've improved a little bit. Right? And they gave us a scenario. I had to ask or answer with or respond with open questions. I was terrible at it. And it's a hard thing to do. So I've been on the active listening course and one of the best pieces of information I've ever had was, they happened to be tied hand in hand, is I was home one time and it comes from very much close at home from my wife and I was sitting there and I was doing something and I was reading something at the bench and she was talking to me and I responded with something that was completely irrelevant to what she asked me. Right? So she came come up to me and she goes, honey, I don't need you 
to listen to reply. I need you to listen to understand. And that ties in very well with the active listening. Now, even though I got that advice from home, because some of the complaints that we get, you wouldn't believe it, I go into Joan's office and I keep picking on Joan. Joan, Susie, Steve and Betty have done A, B and C. Ah, well, I'll just stop this. Storms out the door and says, all right, whatever you're doing, stop doing it. That's not active listening. And it's listen to, re she's replying, whereas I wanted to understand. So if you can take that information back, and blokes, that's a free tip for you tonight when you're at home anyway, so at least you got something out of that. The role of employees. Very rarely do WorkSafe go down this path, but employees have responsibilities under the Act, duties. Section 25 can be prosecuted. Very rarely, but it can happen. What's it say about what's what do employees have to do? They've got to take reasonable care for the health and safety of other persons by their acts or omissions. Acts is pretty straightforward to define, isn't it? Act, what was said, what was done. What about omissions? What's that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Fail to act. An employer who fails to act. The other part which suits the employers when the employers go, and it's not an employee versus the employer because it's all together. And sometimes the employer representatives will say, oh, this is just stacked against us, mate. I've done this and I've done that. Great. If you met some of the obligations? Because the other part here about Section 25 talks about the employer must cooperate with their employer in relation to action taken by the employer to comply with the Act and regs. So really what I'm saying there, the employee has to comply with the action taken by the employer. So if I've got a bullying policy, you comply with that policy. I've got a hearing policy, you comply with that hearing policy. I can't sit there and physically put the earplugs or muffs on your head, but what I'm saying to you is that I've met my responsibility. What you choose to do from there and work safe, knock on my door because I've got a noise complaint or bullying complaint, I'm trying to meet my responsibility. So it goes both ways. There is section there for the the employees. Social media, a number of our complaints now come from social media, social media platforms. I talked about those policies before. If you don't have a social media policy, I suggest you put one in place. It's a way that employees can communicate between themselves, the communication can take the form of bullying. Easy to find, easy to record, easy to reference. I wrote down here last night, social networking, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, they're the order of one to four. I think we did our, we, when we do our um, survey recently, you know, the ABS, whatever that, the census sort of thing, you know. 17 million active accounts in Australia on Facebook. That's a lot, because you know, what are we looking for in Facebook? I want to be liked, yeah? I want to be liked, yeah, so. Um, but it is coming through a number of our service requests in terms of the use of social media, having awareness. Clearly the younger generation, probably more prevalent to those in the mid, but the mids are catching up now because they're learning from the younger generation. So really in the absence of a social media policy, you may have a gap in your workplace to really say that you're doing everything you can for the prevention and response to workplace bullying. It's not new social media. The numbers don't tell you it's new. You know, if you go up, if you end up in the court system, you know, you're talking about state of knowledge. You're talking about it giving the employees the highest level of protection around a policy. You think any magistrate's going to sit there and go, oh, well, I don't accept you don't know about social media. Everyone knows about social media. This slide I'll spend a little bit of time on because really what you want to know is you want to know, oh, okay, mate. There's 13 of me in the state. Let's talk about what I do when I get to your workplace. And I want to hear a little bit from you too. This rolls into a bit of Q&A. It's getting late in the day, half past three. Let's just call it, because you want to know, if I come knocking on your door, this is how things work. Yeah? So predominantly I do response work and project work. I'll do with the project work. That's where there might be an industry or an area where there's a spike in claims. It goes right up to our chief executive. 
She'll get her you know, reports regularly and she'll go, oh, I don't like what I'm seeing here. Send it back down and say, go out into this industry and make some inquiries. Let's find out what's going on. So we have a number of projects going right through the year at any time. Two, three, sometimes four projects that sort of go for three, four, five, six, maybe 12 months, the life cycle of the project. For example, one you probably wouldn't expect, we've got a project at the moment about hairdressing. I almost cringe when that come through our meeting. Hairdressing for me, you know. Um, yeah, no, people are laughing. How do you think I go into those salons, you know? Two or three people and the hairdryer going and things like that. But anyway, there's an increase. There's an increase in bullying, hairdressing. People have their own opinions why. But we have to go in and we have to go find out and have a look at their policies, procedures. That gets filtered back to our project people, report back, we'll see if we can make a bit of a change. So if we knock on your door, we'll tell you we're here because either there's a complaint or we're here for a project. So it'll either be industry specific, sometimes we do towns, suburbs, there might be an increase in whatever capacity. So that's the project. Fairly low level stuff, we'll probably have a look at your policies, see what's in place, spend a bit of time there, you know, more proactive sort of thing, you know. What about response? Oh, here we go. I've got a complaint, right? How does the complaint system work? What we have, we have someone in your workplace, feels like they're being bullied, they call our advisory service. Our advisory service sends out what's known as a summary of events form. It's a nine-page document. The complainant, so we call them the complainants, completes that and returns that back to WorkSafe. On that form, it's got the employer's name, address, the complainant's name. It's got five areas where they can fill out five separate incidents. Time, date, location, person involved, any witnesses. That gets sent back into WorkSafe. That doesn't mean it automatically goes through a process. There's still a filtering process. An inspector will go into the advisory unit at 222 Exhibition Street and read through those summary of events forms. If that inspector feels that there's enough grounds there to make some further inquiries, that will then form what's known as a job. All right, so it's not just a matter of ringing up, so just be aware, response, don't just ring up, we're just not going at a random while well, we're here in relation to that, okay? As I said, I think the numbers are up around 5,500 get through. There is a screening criteria. Sometimes there's not filtering young workers and vulnerable workers go straight through, okay, without a summary of events form. And sometimes the young and vulnerable, it won't be them who make the call. They won't be the complainant. Often it's their parents or someone known to them. So that is straight through to the inspector to make some inquiries. Okay, so I've got the summary of events form. It's landed on my desk. What am I going to do with it? It's got the details of the person. My manager or senior inspector will allocate that to the best fit, who they think may have the best skills to deal with that type of job, depending on what the type of job it is. So what we do is we pick up the phone to um, Bob. Go, Bob, Damien from WorkSafe, I've got your summary of events here. Okay, yeah, thanks, Damien. How are you feeling? Oh, mate, oh, this is just crazy. This is nuts. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do is we've got to meet. We arrange to meet either at a neutral location, could be a, ca a cafe, or into the WorkSafe office. We let the complainant sort of determine that because there's triggers because sometimes the complainants are in fairly fragile states. Even the WorkSafe brand could be a trigger. You know, they might have put a claim in already. There might have been some hiccups through that complaint process. So they'll align the brand straight away with that. They might not want to come into an office that looks a bit sterile. They might want to just do it at their local caf cafe and they prefer that we just sort of come in just a shirt and jeans, whatever it may be. So we go and we meet with them, and the purpose of that meeting is to go through the nature of those allegations and clarify any information we think we need. At this stage, the employer hasn't been contacted. The only thing that an inspector would have done with the employer is that we have the ability to what's known as profile the business. We'll profile your workplace. We'll generally tell me who was last there, any recent claims, any prosecutions, get a bit of information on who we're dealing with, if there's some information there. So we meet with the complainant. 
We go through the, and there's a question that we need to ask the complainant. What do you want to do with this? And I go, oh, you know, what are my options? Go, okay. Well, listen, if you want us to go and talk to the employer and put the allegations forward, you can't be anonymous. So there it is. That's the question. You can't be anonymous. If you want these allegations to go and be put forward to the employer, you can't be anonymous. Make sense? Too harsh? You know, WorkSafe's got core fundamental values, accountability, transparency. They're two, but the transparency. So what sort of responses do you reckon we'll get? Oh. Depends, really, doesn't it? It depends if... The person might already be off work. The person might need the job that badly. They feel like they're in a no-win no position. We can, mate, I can't send you in there. I can't, be, I can't do this. I've got three kids and a mortgage. I, I need this job. So that's the question we ask. There's all variables around that question. All right, so we get it. He goes, yep, go ahead. You know, I hate Jimmy. Take Jimmy's job, take his house, take everything you can, go your hardest. Go your absolute hardest. Here's 15 witnesses, here's this, here's all my evidence. All right. So now it's time to meet the employer. So I'm talking to you guys now. Employers, you're all employers today, as much as your employees as well. Um, do you want me to ring first or should I just rock up? I don't know, what works? What do you think? Is it reasonable or just rock up? Look at this complaint, fairly significant complaint. Two o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. I don't know, so it's Monday. It's this Monday, because you've all got cup day, you know. Probably half of them won't be here on Monday, so I won't get anyone, but um, what do you think? Might not be there, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I'm state-based. Right. I, I live down at Geelong and I've got this job in Wangaratta. I'm not going home, mate. I'm, I'll tell you, I'm not, you know, I'm not, t I'm not going home, am I? Am I? I'm not sure. But you're right, person may not be there. What else is an issue if I just rock up unannounced? Is there any big issue other than the person not being there? Because our policy just says attend the workplace. Make inquiries attend the workplace. For you guys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, if the complainant's there, yeah. Yep. But anyway, they said go your hardest and they're still there. Yeah, so that's right. But I've got to, some stage I've got to step in, don't I? But it can be confronting. Yeah. Because be, wouldn't it be much better if I knocked on your door and I said, oh, I'm just here in relation to that light globe up there? Ah, oh, yeah, get Johnny, he does our maintenance, he get him on the ladder and uh, fix that, it's not personal, uh, we're talking about mental health. Because what's, what's the normal position if I rock up and go, I'm here in relation to a bullying complaint? It's very normal to get defensive, isn't it? And what questions are we running through your head straight away? Who is it? Yeah, who's involved? Yeah, that's right. And how do I get to that right person? Because generally a lot of there's admin, isn't there? There's an admin, there's a reception. What do I say to reception? G'day, I'm Damien here from WorkSafe. Hear about a bullying complaint? And then reception gets it and she's at lunch in, well, he's at lunch in two or three hours, goes, oh, you know, WorkSafe's here, it's bullying. So now I'm in control, isn't there? What about the other way? How about I'll ring? Come on, because I'm going to Wenger, right? Uh, I'm not driving up there if I don't know anyone's there. I'll get on the phone. Does that work? Well, you tell me, because you, you, you tell me what you want me to do. Because sometimes when I knock on the door, people go, don't you ring first? What's this, don't you ring? Oh, I'm not ringing this time. So the comment was made down here, for those who didn't hear, a WorkSafe inspector attended a workplace unannounced, felt confronted, their inspector returned a week later, 
and the employer representing felt more controlled in the process, which is a fair comment. If I ring, if I ring first, right, what am I going to say on the phone? Uh, I'm Damien um, from WorkSafe, and yeah, you've got the HR manager, and she's like, what's, um, what's it about, Damien? Oh, I've got an allegation of bullying. And what's the next question she's going to say to me? Bang, who's involved? So suddenly I give this information to the HR manager at Wangaratta, right? And she goes, I oh, haven't heard of it, first I've heard of it, um, no worries, when do you want to come up? Oh, I can't get there till, uh, what day is it today? Wednesday. Can't get there till Friday. Okay, no worries. I don't know this HR manager. She's got this information for 48 hours. What's the risk? What risk, what organisational risk do WorkSafe have? What risk do I have as an inspector? Yeah. So if the complainant was your son and daughter, what do you want me to do? Go straight there. If the employer represented you with your husband and wife, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Yeah, within, yeah that's, that's a way. But, you know, the way, the way my experience is, is, there's a lot of capability and competency out there outside the walls at WorkSafe, you know. You guys are intelligent people. Saying, hey, listen, I, yeah, I've got a matter that needs raising, right? Because you get that call and you go, oh, well, I've still got to talk to, who am I talking to? The executive, the CEO, the HR, the super, I don't know what it really means. And then you're, I'll probably put a bit of anxiety onto you. It's almost that first date syndrome, isn't it? If I know I'm taking a girl out on Friday, she'll start prepping from last week. Is that true? But if I see to her out in the foyer this afternoon, come on, we go get a coffee, it just rolls better, doesn't it? But I'm saying there's sometimes unnecessary anxiety. Whether that was the best analogy, I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> unnecessary anxiety. So the question is, yeah, I don't think there's a right answer, but it's important that I get the feedback from you around these seminars. You know, and just be mindful, I guess, what I'm trying to convey or communicate to you is to understand our position to an extent, but it's really important that we understand your position too. You know. and, and what's wrong with attending the workplace, getting to the right person? And there's nothing wrong with you guys saying, it's the first I've heard of it, or yes, we're aware of it in part. Um, how long do you need, Damien? I might need two hours, I might need three, I'm not sure. Is there any way we could do this in 48 hours' time? It's reasonable, isn't it? At least I've had a conversation with you. I say, I'm okay with that process, but just be aware to maintain this in the strictest confidence. Right? So there's nothing wrong with that. You can have that conversation. Why not? Just have it. You know, I'd feel better that way. But so you guys should feel a little bit empowered to say, oh, yeah, this is where it sits. A little bit different to a general hazard, all right? I don't want you taking this back if works safe knock on the door for something that's not guarded or, you know, don't start saying, can we do this in 48 hours? I went to this bullying presentation and, you know, this bloke's up the front saying, you know, buy myself a couple of days. No, no, no. We're talking about the seriousness of the matter. We're talking about the different level of inquiry. Okay, so just be aware and of uh, how that works. And again, of course, there'll be some times where you may not be afforded that opportunity all the time. So don't take as a hard and fast rule, but I'm saying there is no hard and fast rule at our end. Don't make it at your end. Let's have a little bit of give and take, but just be aware sometimes there are extreme circumstances and you're probably not going to be afforded that opportunity if it's extreme or young workers, or vulnerable workers, particularly if those people are still at the workplace and there's a risk that potentially is still ongoing. So, how yeah, we're going for time? Not bad, because we've got questions, if you don't have any, because it's the last session. 
I understand, but I will be hanging around. Anything general um, in nature, just um, yell out something specific. Uh, you know, I'll be hanging around, I think, here or somewhere. Yeah. Here. So, um, yeah, but I'll, I'm happy to take any questions at all. If you just wouldn't mind waiting a moment, we've got some microphones coming down just so everybody can hear. It's just the lady here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you said that if an employee is complaining about a boss bullying them, for example, that that employee has to name names and times and dates specific to you first, correct? In the summary of events, yes. So if they want to raise the allegation, they complete it and they say, yep, this is what occurred and this okay. is who did what. If it's on the other foot and the employer is claiming that an employee has been a health and safety risk to your other colleagues, do they have to name names, dates and times of that specific behaviour to you? If the employer yes, has raised the matter with WorkSafe saying there's an employee that is upsetting other people and risking their health and safety, and they inform that employee, do they have to give details of who the colleagues are that whose health and safety is at risk? Well, if you're going to make some inquiries and you're going to have a look at charging an employee under Section 25, mm -hmm. you'd have to what's what we form is po points of proof and base of belief. Mm -hmm. So it'd have to be person X mm -hmm. said or did or acted this way to person Y. You couldn't have it, you'd have to have some concrete evidence to link the action that has the impact and what's the impact of the health and safety of that person. As a result, they did this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they put glue in his hair mm -hmm. and as a result, this was the injury that was suffered. So it can't be just non-specific, she's upsetting people. Full what was stop. that, sorry? It can't be non-specific, this employee is upsetting other people. Not, not general. I mean, okay. you know, like you got to, yeah. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Specific. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Just want to ask a question about the challenge of direct and indirect. Um, it can be a lot easier, I think, to identify direct bullying and examples of what occurs. What about the, the subtle behaviours that result in um, people being injured from workplace bullying? How do you go in a, around an investigation in, those, in terms of those behaviours? And what's the success rate, if I, if I can put it that way, of those types of investigations by you guys? Yeah, so two parts to the question. Uh, clearly, indirect behaviours is a challenge for us to investigate. Clearly. Where do we start? I had an example. Uh, two people, work-related trip, put one employee in a five-star, put another one in a three-star. Accommodation. Person say they'll part, form part of their bullying case, right? Go to the finance manager, said, no, we've got budget requires. This person sits this in the organisation, this sits this. That's what it's about. But yes, clearly the indirect takes time. Look through policies, talk to witnesses, anything around past behaviours, performance reviews, all that makes up part of that. In terms of the success rate, so if... If we find that bullying has occurred and we've got policies and we end up putting it through what's known as through the referral, so we investigators take it over and they take it up for prosecution. Uh, WorkSafe, carefully, I'm in general form. General, WorkSafe will only take things that they think have a fair bit of substance in it. Okay? And the obvious reason is that because we want to send a message to the community. If something goes up before the courts and we weren't successful, what sort of message, you know, we sort of, so we sort of, I wouldn't say it's a no risk policy but we go through the appropriate channels to ensure that everything's lined up, that we think we have a significant case um, around the prosecution. I don't have the stats in front of me, unfortunately, um, which I probably should have bought, you know, just give you an indication. But, yeah, for something to go up, and look, not everything goes up, just, just to say if you don't have a policy, you don't, think, oh, I don't have a policy, I'm going to get caught. Not everything goes up. There's circumstances around that. And we've got very set criteria about what goes through, and there's a there's a chain of command quite significant before it ends up even with the prosecutors. I guess I probably have a follow-up question on that or comment around it depends on what you define by success. So success in something like this is not just a prosecution, would that be correct? Yeah, yeah that's true. That's I mean, um, you know, there's other, there's other um, 
penalties, if you like, so not solely from prosecution. Obviously, the prosecution's the public one, you know, because it sort of sends the message through. But again, you know, I'm down in the Geelong area. Um, it is still a big town, so things get, the information gets through. Not so much, I guess, through the city, but people talk, mm. you know, and mm. particularly when it comes to bullying, you know, I find employers respond pretty well, mm. you know, or if I went there for a, something to do with a forklift, oh, yeah, well, you know, we get to it. But yeah, bullying, bullying still has that stigma attached, you know, and it's interpretive, isn't it? We can sit here because it's behaviour related, as I said. So. Yeah, mm. yeah, it is definitely a tricky one. Um, we have a question over the back here. Thank you. Yeah, my question is um, often if someone's been bullied, they might actually take the, the, the step of leaving. What's the situation around retrospective complaints? Is that possible? And if possible, um, how, what, how much time can pass before uh, a complaint yes. can be made? So the question is, yep. Yeah. So just if you do leave, absolutely still put the complaint forward. Generally, there's a two year for the statute of limitations. However, um, there's um, interpretation around that, okay? So, yeah, so yes, just, you know, you might leave a year ago, you still got it affected, impact, still put it through, yep. I have a question. So, uh, in the situation where you've employed someone to do a particular job and uh, the expectation is, you know, this is your role, we've got an understanding, and that person can't fulfil that job, but they go on stress leave because they can't fulfil the job, but they haven't said that they can't fulfil the job. What, how would you approach that situation where the employer's perspective is they were in, the individual was employed for this sp specific job, but they don't have the capability and therefore go on stress leave because they don't have the capability to do that job but didn't say anything? Yeah, good one. That's a good <laughs> question. You've been reading my files? Because <laughs> that's very common. Yeah, it's very common because the stress, anxiety, you know, talk about the stress and the bullying anxiety, it is filtered into the one thing. You're right. And our system, our system is a no-fault system, isn't it? WorkSafe system is a no-fault system at that instance. I'm feeling overawed. I don't feel like I'm supported in the workplace. I feel like I've been given too much work. The work is above my, above my capabilities. I'm stressed. I'm out of here. You're my manager. You bullied me. I told, bullied me. I told you. I'm done. Yeah, you're right. Um, I, there's no simple answer to that question other than, because every circumstance will be slightly different in terms of what they're employed for, their length of employment, performance reviews that are undertaken. You know, all those things would have to be the general nature of the inquiries that would, be, that would be made. It's not for me to interpret, can someone put out 110 widgets, is that reasonable? You know, how am I getting, why should I be commenting on that? I don't know. But in terms of what their skill sets were, skill sets, what their day-to-day -day workload looks like, was it a replacement position, is it a new position, which has some relevance? That's generally a nature of inquiry because, you know, if we had Johnny over here pumping out 110 widgets and we've got a new person who's doing 20, there's probably a big difference to sort of say, oh, I think we could have done that, we could have met those capabilities. But if it's brand new and you're using 110 as a benchmark and he's only doing 20, where's your 110 coming from? But they're general inquiries that you'd make. Have the conversation. Damien, we employed Johnny to do this. Here's his resume. This is how it read up. Here's his performance reviews. Here's the reviews monthly done for during the probation period. That's the sort of thing that we'd be looking for. Any more questions? Yeah, we've got one down here. Um, so we'll go over here first and then we'll come up the back there. Um, I was just wondering about the touchy subject of confidentiality, of course. You said you ask the worker, they fill out the nine-page document and then you ask them whether they want to go ahead with it, which means they um, basically, um, you know, there's no more confidentiality around it. I suspect you get a lot of no, I don't want to yep. go on. Um, what, what kind of recourse have they got then? Yeah, we do, you do. We get times where there's no. So if there's a no, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't go to the workplace. Mm -hmm. However, we won't be able to go and put those specific allegations. We might go and make general inquiries. Mindful, work safe, transparency is one of our key things. So if we knock on your door, very rarely we'll be saying the reason, either proactive visit or there's a complaint, all right? But there is a matter of recourse, yes. And it's a discretion of my management. 
Um, just up the back. Oh uh, yes, it's just in relation to uh, taking more of a preventive approach. So a situation where someone you might have a HSI put in a PIN notice or maybe go through the issue resolution procedure where they're claiming that the current policies and procedures are inadequate and they want to actually have it changed and altered. I wonder if you've ever had that type of process. Oh, not specifically, but as soon as um, you have a health and safety rep, very important um, position, you know, within the Act and the workplace, if something's inadequate, why is it inadequate? What is it? A date alone on a policy doesn't make something inadequate. Social media, maybe I looked at a policy the other day, 2014, things have sort of moved along a bit, but in essence, why is it inadequate? Yeah, well then that, that's, they're, two, they're separate things, all right? So if they're not having training on it, ongoing training's a requirement, but it doesn't make the policy inadequate. It just means that the person's not being trained on that policy. Probably got time for one more question if we've got a... For anyone? No, which means I get to ask one. Oh, so yeah. from... Oh, <laughs> so from... from um, I guess listening to you, obviously, um, by the time a bully inspector gets called in to come to a workplace, things are pretty damaged or down a track or, you know, it can be hard to come back. What is one piece of advice you would give to the people in the room today to try and prevent, I guess, you knocking on their door as much as I'm sure you've charmed them and they'll be happy to have you come and say hello, but to, to prevent them from actually having a visit from the inspector around bullying? Yeah, look, I can't enforce enough, and I'm probably not telling you anything here different, is the ability around communication, the ability to have that conversation and listen. That is just absolutely fundamental. But it's fundamental in life, but really what we're dealing with, we're dealing with behaviours, aren't we? If you see it at first instance and you've got the ability to communicate it out and be very mindful, when I say communication, I'm not saying just dealing with a complainant. What about the persons who are alleged to have done the bullying? You know, how do you think they feel if they don't think what they said or their actions really constituted that? So the one bit of advice I've got is you're going to have to look at your resourcing and your staff and where you're placed and the strengths of your staff, and you'll have them. They'll be in your organisation. We're talking about people. People are good. Invest in them. If you think they need to go on to an active listening or whatever <laughs> it may be, do it. I know I've put it a little bit of a light-hearted spin on it, but if I spend 50 minutes talking about really hardcore stuff, we go out feeling a little bit deflated. Hopefully I've tried to say, these are the controls that you need. There's an enormous serious side to it. I understand that. I live, this is what I do, right? And I see that. Today, there's some lightheartedness involved, but there's some serious things that go out there. You know, I've got a file on my desk at the moment, come from the coroner, young girl committed suicide, left a note related put in there about work-related bullying. Really, comp these are the sort of things that go through. Put yourself in the employer's shoes, the family shoes. The family want answers. They need to know what's going on. The employer, they're upset, distraught, young workplace. News to them that this note's there. So it's there, it's serious. I know I've put a bit of a light-hearted spin on it, but hopefully the message in, the, in what I'm trying to achieve here in terms of the controls that you need and empower you guys to engage with us and have those conversations. Have them. Very good. Thank you very much, Damien. Please join me in thanking Damien for his time today. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. That is a wrap. Um, thank you very much for your attendance at not only this session but at any of the sessions that you attended for Health and Safety Month. Don't forget that we are very keen to get your feedback. Um, so the link is up on the screen here, also the QR code. So I hope that you found the, whatever sessions you've attended very informative and you have at least one tip to take back to your workplace and start doing things differently. Thank you very much. Sick, but I'm on the floor.